morning. Buenos dias. Bonjour. Ecaro domo. How are we doing today, brothers and sisters? Good. Well, it's good to be here in the, in the, in the house of God, with the family of God. Uh, I just want to reiterate what was said about our groups. We got our group starting here September 4th. Uh, we got a women's group going. We got uh, our marriage group, The Knot, with Pastor Ryan and Lynn. We got trauma healing facilitated by myself and Narissa. And so we got groups starting in the homes too. And, and, uh, and so we want our people to get connected, get plugged in, and to grow in their li- relationship with Christ. And so great way to do that is to get into uh, either a class here or in a small group in your homes. And so I encourage you to sign up for that on our app. And uh, as we get started here in September, whenever we preach the word, uh, yes, there is teaching and there is application, uh, but my favorite part about preaching is simply getting to share what God has been uh, teaching me, what God has been doing in my life. And at the end of the day, that's what discipleship is, right? What God is teaching you, where God is challenging you, and we have life Uh, relationships and life on life relationships and we get to ask each other hey what's God teaching you where's God challenging you and in preaching we get to do that in a unique way and so if you allow me today uh, just to share what God has been teaching me my wife and I Narissa went to the Dominican Republic last week Uh, we were gone uh, last weekend visiting a ministry called La Foi uh, which means faith in action and we were visiting this uh, organization in the Dominican Republic. Uh, it's actually the directors of La Foi actually come here to Ben Davis Christian Church. Their names are Lisa and Wilbert Romain. Maybe you've had the chance to hear their story and hear how God has moved in their lives. Uh, and so we were down there last week hearing about their ministry that predominantly serves uh, Haitian refugees that are living in the Dominican Republic. And so it was, uh, it was a, a powerful experience for us, an encouraging experience, just to see what they do and how they live. And, uh, and unfortunately, uh, the Dominican government doesn't take very favorably to their Haitian neighbors. And so uh, we got to see unfortunate uh, housing situations for a lot of these Haitians and poor uh, labor and, and uh, just kind of some of the uh, extortion that takes place, but how the Haitian churches are taking care of their neighbors. And so uh, one of the sad things that we went to go and experience was uh, the detention centers that uh, the government there in the DR puts their Haitian neighbors in. Uh, Not much hygiene or food and drink, Um, but there you have pastors, Haitian pastors going and ministering to their brothers and sisters. And so that was um, helpful to see as well, but also heartbreaking. Uh, but let me share with you, with you one of my favorite moments from the trip this past week as we visited La Foi and their Haitian churches and pastors. Uh, last Sunday was a 16th anniversary of one of the churches there, and uh, that place was packed full. We're under a tin roof. Uh, there's like 200 people in here, and I don't think I've sweat that much in a long time. We're sweating, the person next to me sweating, and it, it, we're just worshiping the Lord together. Uh, but I'd love to share in their joy together with, uh, with us this morning. If you would turn your eyes to the screen and uh, kind of see their celebration. joy to be there to celebrate their 16th anniversary and one of my favorite things of the trip was being in that church and noticing a sign in the back uh, there was a sign in the back that had Ephesians 4 5 and Ephesians 4 5 says this it says one Lord one faith one baptism Ephesians 4 5 dice un solo Señor un solo fe un solo bautismo ajen yon sel seye yon sel confianza yon sel batem and so they had these two signs in the back, Ephesians 4, 5, and one was in Haitian Creole and the other one was in Spanish. And so we're talking about fellow believers, brothers and sisters, even pastors, uh, who live in regular fear of being taken in by the Dominican government. And on their wall, they have Ephesians 4, 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. 
un solo Señor, un solo fe, un solo bautismo. En yon sel se ye, yon sel confianza, yon sel batem. Despite, despite the fear, despite the hostility towards them, they will still strive to walk in grace with their neighbors. And I think we can learn a thing or two from our Haitian brothers and sisters living in the DR this morning. And, uh, and that's what we're going to talk about today. We've been in a series uh, going through the book of Galatians. And so it fits well uh, with what we're going to be reading today in Galatians chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to open them up to Galatians chapter 3. We're going to be in verse 23. Si tienen sus Biblias, por favor, ábrenlo al libro de Galatas, capítulo 3. Versículo 23, ahí vamos a empezar un ratito. We're going to be starting there in just a few minutes. Uh, we have been in a series called Grace Over Grind in the book of Galatians. And we are overhearing a conversation that the Apostle Paul is having with the churches in Galatia. And the Apostle Paul was someone who was a persecutor of Christians uh, because he was a, a devout follower, a staunch follower of the Old Testament laws, the Torah. Uh, but he had had an encounter with the resurrected Jesus, as many of us in here have, and he turned from darkness and into light. And he went on to plant many churches in this place called Galatia. And if you, uh, it's been said that the book of Galatians is a, is a defense in gospel freedom, a defense in gospel liberty. Galatas es una defensa de la libertad del evangelio. And what does it mean to be people who have been set free from the good, with the good news of Jesus? In another one of the New Testament books, in the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter uh, 3, verse 17, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is liberty. Ahora bien, el Señor es el Espíritu, y a donde está el Espíritu del Señor, ahí hay libertad. And it's that liberty, it's that freedom that Paul is addressing here in the book of Galatians. And Paul is pretty passionate, or maybe even frustrated as he's writing to the Galatians. Uh, and we can tell that because when we read other letters that the Apostle Paul has written, like Romans or Corinthians or Ephesians or other letters, Paul often addresses himself uh, at the beginning of his letter with an introduction, right? Paul, an apostle of Christ, sent by the will of God. And then he goes on to offer a form of a thanksgiving. Hey, here, I want to thank you for, you know, praying for me, for inviting me in. Uh, however, here in the book of Galatians, uh, Paul skips the thanksgiving. And he goes straight to the point in Galatians 1, 6, just to provide a little bit of context of what's happening in this book. Galatians 1, 6 says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. Paul is angry and he's frustrated that the Christians in Galatia are being led astray by people who are preaching a contrary doc, uh, doctrine, a different gospel. And if you're new to church, uh, the gospel is simply the good news of Jesus, that you and I have fallen short of God's perfect standard, uh, that uh, we can't, uh, but Jesus did, and because Jesus did, we can. He lived a life that you and I cannot live, and uh, he has given us, his, given us his spirit so that we might be able to live empowered lives, and we look forward to when he returns. And so Paul preached the, to the Galatian Christians that they are saved by grace through faith, not by the works of the law. However, but within the Galatian churches, uh, there are people preaching a different gospel, and they're referred to as the Judaizers, as Pastor Ryan talked about last week, because they were Jews, uh, ethnic Jews, who had heard the good news of Jesus, but began to twist it. They were sharing the good news with Gentiles or non-Jews, those who were not part of God's covenant people, according to the Old Testament. They began to tell people that in order to follow Jesus and to be saved, they needed to accept him and do something else. If you ever hear anybody say that in order to be saved, you got to accept Jesus and do something else, uh, you, should, you should be running. You don't, you don't need to listen to that person. But here in Galatia, you have people doing just that. 
people. They're saying you need to accept Jesus and live as an ethnic and religious Jew and follow all of the laws of the Old Testament and the Torah. For example, one of the things that they required that their Gentile believers do is get circumcised. Why? Because this was a custom that the Jews were familiar with in the law. But that's not the gospel that Paul had preached when he had gone there and planted the churches. No, in Ephesians uh, 2, verse 8 through 9, Paul says, For it is by grace you have been saved, not uh, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. But the Judaizers were twisting the good news into what they were familiar with. And as we often do, here's what the Galatians did. They took the gospel and they conformed it to their culture, as opposed to letting the gospel transform their culture. Tomaron el evangelio y lo adaptaron a su cultura en lugar de dejar que el evangelio transformara su cultura. They took the gospel and conformed it to their culture as opposed to allowing the gospel to transform their culture. And we go really down a wrong direction, brothers and sisters, when we take the gospel and we conform it to our perspective, to how we think or what we think is right, as opposed to letting Jesus and the Holy Spirit transform the way that we live. Let's read the text that we have today, Galatians chapter 3, verse... uh, 23, hear the word of the Lord. Paul says, before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. And now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So in Christ, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Everybody say one, one. You are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What I'm saying is that as long as an heir is under age, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also when we were under age, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship because you are his sons. God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has also made you an heir. That is the word of the Lord. Pray with me this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word. We just ask, Holy Spirit, that you come into this space. You come into our people. If there's people in here this morning, right now, who are struggling, um, meet them right now. Have a word for them today. And uh, we are grateful, Father, that we are no longer slaves bound to this world, but, Lord, that you have made us children, and into children also heirs. And we thank you, Jesus. Amen. Let me give you two illustrations of what Paul is saying here in the first few verses of our text. Uh, Maybe you're a parent in the room and you have kids right now who are getting their license. And uh, you know, there's, there's, before you get your license, you got to get something first. What's that thing called you get before your license? Uh, a permit, yeah. So you get a permit, and uh, a permit allows you to drive, but not completely, right? You got to, in order to drive legally, you have to have uh, someone with a license, someone older, uh, driving with you in the passenger seat until, until you're able to take a, a, a driving license test, and then you're able to get the license and then drive on your own. Uh, recently, this week, I saw a post from a family in our church who had a kid who just learned to ride their bike. And if you're teaching your kid how to ride a bike, you usually start off with training wheels, right? Up until the point, until they get confidence enough to, to ride the bike on their own and no longer need to ride with training wheels. And here in verses 23 to 25, it's pretty much what Paul is saying and how he is describing the Old Testament law. 
uh, verse 23, Paul says, Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith was to come, would be revealed. So the law was our guardian, our permit, our training wheels, until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we, no longer, uh, we are no longer under a guardian, under a permit, under training wheels. The word that Paul uses to describe the law is guardian or tutor. And during the time in which Paul is writing, a guardian was usually someone, a slave, who took care of a child up until the point that that child could take care of themselves. A guardian uh, would, would take care of the kid, and the kid would eventually grow up to the point where they no longer needed a tutor or a guardian. And so Paul is saying that the laws of the Old Testament were never meant to be the, the way by which peace would be gained the way in which the enemy would be destroyed, the way in which God would restore his people, and the way in which we would find life and life to the fullest. The law, Paul says, was meant to guide us, to point us, to lead us to the one who would fulfill the law, which is Jesus. And so Paul is saying, hey, you don't need to live according uh, to the way that we used to live because Christ has come and he has fulfilled the law. You've heard me say it before that reading the Bible is a cross-cultural exercise. Leer la Biblia es un ejercicio transcultural. We're engaging with the text that was not written to us or by us, but for us. And in verses 23 to 25, we see uh, a display of someone who has gone through a spiritual transformation and has had an encounter with Jesus and has allowed that the gospel to transform their culture. If there was anyone in the New Testament who loved the Old Testament law, the Torah, it was Paul. In uh, the book of Philippians, chapter 3, Paul says this. He says, though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Paul is boasting in this moment. He says, uh, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I am of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrew. In regards to law, I was a Pharisee. As for zeal, I persecuted the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. And what we're experiencing in Galatians chapter 3, verses 23 to 25, is a testimony of someone who has not allowed the gospel to conform to their perspective, but has allowed the gospel to transform their culture. We have someone who says, God, change the way that I view life. Change my perspective. Change the things that I take pride in. Take the things, Lord, that have no business uh, being uh, uh, associated with you, Jesus, and toss them by the wayside. Because I no longer want to live by what I think is right. I no longer want to live according to the law or my flesh. But I want to live by your grace, Jesus. That's what we're seeing here in the first three verses. Chapter, 20, uh, chapter 3, verse 23 to 25. And that's discipleship. Right? That this is the gospel. It's the willing, willingness to invite Jesus into our life. And say, Lord, have your way. Have your way in me. And that's exciting because it allows for a lifelong participation of Jesus coming into our lives and tossing things aside that don't need to be there. Him coming into our lives and transforming us from the inside out until will we walk in eternity with him and he, he continues to shape us and mold us and change the way that we live. Galatians is a defense of gospel freedom, and we are no longer to be chained down by rules or even our sins or the mistakes that we've made, but by the grace of Jesus that brings new life. In other words, Paul is saying that the law was never meant to guide us, was never meant to save us, but to guide us. The law was never meant to save us, but to guide us. La ley estaba destinada a guiarnos, no a salvarnos. However, it's in the next three verses that I want to hone in on and focus on our time this morning, verses 26 to 29. 
Here's what Paul says. He says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Everybody say one. We are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What is Paul saying here? Some of his language can be a little confusing if you're unfamiliar with the Bible, but let me explain it a little further. From the beginning of scripture, brothers and sisters, God laid out a plan, a desire to bring the nations into his covenant, into his promise, into salvation. This is what is known as, uh, as the Missio Dei, the mission of God. In the first book of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 17, we see a covenant that God makes with Abraham. He says, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you the father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. And I will establish my covenant for an everlasting covenant between me and your descendants after you for your generations to come. And to be your God and be the God of the descendants after you. From the beginning, right, from the jump, God's plan was not simply to save the Israelites, but to save the world, to save the nations, to save you and me. Not to have a mono-ethnic kingdom, but to have a multi-ethnic kingdom. What our text is telling us today is that those of us who belong to Christ Jesus, who put our faith in him, get to share in the promises of God, the promise that God made to Abraham, that you and I are now considered children of God and that we are a part of the family of God. In the Old Testament, one of the signs and ways for entering into the covenant of God was uh, through uh, circumcision, at least for men. It was a sign that you might, that you belong to the people of God. However, Christ provided a new sign for men and women to participate in, a symbol, a sacrament, a sign uh, as baptism. Paul in verse 27 says, for all of you who were baptized in Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And so baptism is a new sign of the covenant that we have put our faith in Jesus and repented of our sins and have decided to follow him for the rest of our lives. That we have died to ourselves and we have been raised to new life and the blood of Christ now washes away our sins and we are clothed by Jesus and we are victorious over sin and death. That we're no longer defined by our past, we're no longer defined by the things uh, that we've done wrong, our mistakes, but we are defined by Christ alone. Amen? Amen? Notice what Paul says in verse 28. He says, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And it's our growing conviction here at Ben Davis Christian Church to be a healthy multi-ethnic church, to borrow the language of Dr. Jamal Williams, to function in church as in heaven. And God has brought the nations to our church and into our city, and it's our desire to be a unified body of believers from every nation, tribe, and tongue that goes from our neighborhoods to the nations. In the book of Revelation, chapter 7, verse 9, John, one of uh, Jesus' disciples, is writing about a vision that he has received about heaven, and here is what he says. He says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. John has a vision from heaven. And within his vision, one of the characteristics that he mentions is an innumerable amount of people from every nation, tribe, and tongue. A multitude of people who have been clothed with Christ and are worshiping the Lord. And that's one of the beautiful characteristics of our congregation here at Ben Davis Christian Church. That we have brothers and sisters from all backgrounds and vocations. We are intergenerational brothers and sisters who are in their 90s and babies who are 90 days old. 
We have brothers and sisters who are wealthy, who work for large organizations, those who struggle to make ends meet, and those in between. Brothers and sisters who have different, uh, different physical conditions and abilities and illnesses. We have different brothers and sisters uh, who are from different countries, whether it's the United States, Honduras, Mexico, Guatemala, Haiti, Venezuela, Republicana Dominicana, Nigeria, Benin, Laos, Congo, and other countries. We have brothers and sisters and those who struggle with their identity. We have brothers and sisters who are white, black, and brown. Brothers and sisters who are married, single, widowed. Brothers and sisters who work in schools, hospitals, airplanes, warehouses, homes, labs, restaurants, military, or retired. Brothers and sisters, we should echo the words of our, our Dominican brothers and sisters, our Haitian brothers and sisters in the DR with Ephesians 4, 5. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Un solo Señor, un solo fe, un solo bautismo. En yon sel seye, yon sel confiance, yon sel batem. We are called to be one. Everybody say one. We are brothers and sisters called to unity. And we have been baptized, we have been saved both from something and for something. We have been saved from sin and the control of the enemy in our lives and into uh, love for God and love for our neighbor. One of the things that our text shows us today is that we are clothed with Christ and that we're called uh, to walk in grace. We are filled with the Spirit to walk in grace. If you have spent time with me, uh, you have heard me quote John 17 verse 21. Uh, Jesus is praying to the Father, and here is what Jesus' prayer is for his people, for his disciples, for the church. He says that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Jesus' prayer for his disciple was unity, and it's also his prayer for us now. He says our unity in Christ actually operates as a mode, as a mechanism for evangelism, that other people would know Jesus because of our unity with God and with one another. When we live as one body, a united people, it proclaims that God is God and that Jesus is Lord. Cuando vivimos con una, un solo cuerpo, nuestra unidad proclama que Dios es Dios y que Jesús es el Señor. When we get baptized and are welcomed into the family of God, we don't cease to be Jews or Greeks, slave or free men and women. Our lived experiences are still very much present. But once we were strangers to God and to one another, but now we are members of the same body and our identity is rooted in Christ Jesus and everything else becomes secondary. It's also a reminder that no culture is greater than another but that each one of our cultures have things that are beautiful and things that need to be restored. And that you don't, live, you don't need to live as an ethnic and religious Jew to follow Jesus. That you don't need to abandon your African tradition to embrace a Western tradition. We see here in Revelation that the gospel takes root in every culture and his spirit does the work of drawing out the beauty and abandoning that which is sinful. You know, I wonder, Christians, if our unity as believers could help bring the kingdom of God here to the west side of Indianapolis, if our Muslim and Sikh neighbors begin to turn their heads and question why people who have no business being with each other are worshiping the same God, are breaking bread together in their homes, and they're confessing their sins to one another and praying that it might actually be a way to evangelize our neighbors that Christ is Lord and that God God is God. Is anyone hearing me this morning? The same goes with Paul's mention about slave and free and men and women. I don't have the opportunity in this message to give it justice, uh, but I recall a story from Dr. John Perkins. Uh, him and his wife, Vera Mae Perkins, lived in Mississippi during the 1960s. He was a pastor down there, and they were... Um, 
civil rights activist. Uh, he mentions how him and his wife were going to open up a medical clinic. And uh, they bought a building in the white part of town. And so they go into the building that they bought. And uh, in the clinic, there is a wall that's dividing uh, white folk and black folk. And so they buy the building. And one of the first things that they do is they take a sledgehammer and they knock down that, that wall, that wall that was dividing them. And in the Gospels, we see that this is what Jesus has done, that Jesus has torn down the dividing wall of hostility, one between us and the enemy, but also be- between us uh, as, as brothers and sisters, as neighbors. And so we are called to, to be one. Similarly, with men and women, it's a reminder that no one gender is greater than another, that both share in the inheritance and the grace and the power and the spirit of Christ Jesus our Lord. So we cannot elevate one another as to believe that simply one gender has something to offer the church and the other does not. We have, uh, for example, African and Middle Eastern uh, women who are studying just a couple blocks down at BDU who secretly go to English classes because they would be rebuked if their husbands would find out. It's just how the culture works. And I wonder, church, if the way that we treated one another as brothers and sisters, the relations that we had as men and women could function as an evangelistic tool for our neighbors. Even right here in our church, the Spirit of God is moving among our women. Our women are coming in droves asking for opportunities to meet, to pray, to grow, and to minister. And we ought to heed the words of the prophet Joel and the apostle Luke who say, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Brothers and sisters, the Lord has called us to be one. Everybody say one. Think about our unity as a church like a marriage. When we are married to someone, the scriptures say that we become one. There's a special unity between a husband and a wife and God. But just because you're married to someone, just because you're one flesh, doesn't mean you get along all the time or you don't get frustrated with one another or even that you want to spend time with your partner. All those things need to be intentional to show one another and demonstrate your love for each other. The scriptures say that just as uh, we are one body, we are also one family. And families sometimes don't get along all that well. Uh, I like how Pastor uh, Brian Loritz puts it. He says, sometimes we're okay with with someone being our brother or sister in Christ, uh, but maybe not so much if they're our brother and (laughs) sister-in-law. Sometimes that changes the dynamic. We have to wrestle there to, to, to believe what we think about someone or even a people group because we'll be rubbing shoulders with them more. How do we do this practically? How do we live as one body? People who have been saved under Christ Jesus, who are on the same playing field under the grace of Christ. Uh, I want to give us three ways to do that this morning. Uh, The first one is seeing Christ in each other. Seeing Christ in each other. Ver a Cristo en el otro. We do that by eating with one another, meeting with people who aren't like us, people who don't talk like us, dress like us, smell like us, eat like us, vote like us, learning to see, the na- uh, to, to see Christ in our brothers and sisters, in our neighbors, in the stranger, and in our enemies. We do that also by carrying each other's burdens, llevando las cargas de cada uno. As a body of believers, we are to rejoice with each other and mourn with one another, to hear when one part of our body is aching that we give it attention and see what it needs, carrying each other's burdens. Uh, The last point I would give for that is living in the light is another way we live in unity. In 1 John, it says that when we live in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another. And so living in the light, we need to be people who learn to confess our sins with each other, telling the truth and living with a posture of reconciliation, that we can mend our relationships and we don't have to wait until eternity to restore relationships if they can be restored right now. Lastly, uh, the portion of our text in verses four, one through seven, I won't give it too much attention, but it talks about adoption. It says, because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. 
the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but God's child. Since you are God's child, God has made you also an heir. You and I have been clothed with Christ and called to walk in grace, that we are no longer slaves to sin, but children and adopted into the family of God. I heard uh, something that impacted me recently from a pastor named Susie Gomez. She's a pastor out in California, and she mentioned that, uh, that for a long time she lived her life wanting to hear uh, the words from God, well done, good and faithful servant. And, uh, and that's something beautiful that we should strive to hear, but sometimes it can also lead us to have an older brother mentality. If you're you're familiar with the story of the prodigal son, where we begin to, to serve Jesus out of a desire to be loved as opposed to out of a posture of love. And so she mentioned something that, that really stuck with me. She, she said, uh, she instead, while she wants to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, she also wants to hear this, welcome home, daughter. Welcome home, son. And I don't know, that did something in me where I was like, sheesh, you know, like God actually just loves me and he loves you. And while he, he, he calls us to serve, he has set out good things for us to do, he also wants to call us home. And so I wanna to speak to someone in here today, maybe someone who hasn't accepted Christ as Lord, that Jesus is talking to you and he wants to say, welcome home, daughter. Welcome home, son. And I invite you to put your faith in Christ Jesus today to get baptized and you can talk to either Pastor Ryan or I today and uh, understand what that decision looks like for you in your life. But I also wanna talk to those of us who've been baptized in Christ Jesus. Is there anybody in here who's grown up in a a, uh, a Catholic background? Yeah, when when you grow up in a Catholic background, when you go into a Catholic church, there is a basin of water. And, uh, and before you walk in, you know, you go and touch the water. And the water is meant to remind you of your baptism. It's to remind you of your baptism, that it's not the, the last step in your Christian journey, right? But it's your first step. And you're reminded of the waters that washed you clean, the blood of Christ Jesus. And so brothers and sisters, I invite us today to remember our baptisms, that we might drip the water of our baptisms into our everyday life and seek to live with one another, people who are clothed with Christ and are called to live in grace. Pray with me. Lord, we love you and we are grateful for you. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you move in our lives. Lord, that right now you are in the work of restoring marriages. You are in the work of bringing people to a knowledge of you. You are bringing people into an understanding of the purpose that you've made for them. People who are lost, people who are hurting. And Holy Spirit, we pray that the body of Christ, not just here at Ben Davis, Lord, but the church in general, Lord, that we might learn uh, to hear what you have said, that you have called us to be one and that your grace is for all, Lord. And so you call us to live in light of that grace. Lead us, Lord Jesus. Amen.